a lot of different indigenous groups, while in Norway, as you all probably know, we have only the Sami people on the traditional land of which we are currently right now. Uh, please move to the, for, to the following slide. So at first glance, this, the, the two regions seem quite uh, different. But uh, on the other hand, when it comes to fishers and aquaculture, they have a lot to share. They are both global stakeholders in uh, marine living resource management, also in uh, academic uh, research and research uh, institution, while their fleet and, uh, and processing plants are using among the best uh, technologies and harvest methods in the world. So both regions uh, have also similar past in terms of uh, uh, regulations with uh, experiencing the establishment of a quota system from the uh, 60s onwards, coming to respond to dialogues about uh, tragedy of commons and replacing the previously practiced common pool uh, regimes. And uh, <clears throat> they also face a lot of similar societal issues, such as out migration to the south, lack of uh, inclusion of uh, indigenous communities and women in the actual uh, working force while uh, nowadays both regions, as every other region in the Arctic, are confronted with the biggest uh, challenge, which is the climate change and environmental challenges. Invasive alien species are visiting both regions. Uh, Arctic species are migrating northwards, while diseases such as related to ocean acidification are uh, afflicting marine living resources, both in Alaska and North Norway. Uh, could you please? So what we did in Alaska, North, the first, uh, our main goal was to assess the status quo challenges and opportunities of industries in the context of blue economies. Okay. And talking about the status quo, we mainly focus on a quantitative assessment of official reports, academic literature, and uh, other numbers dealing with the fish landing, value, production, employment, income, and any other uh, in numbers of interest. And we saw that both regions are uh, uh, are operating in an outstanding successful way and are operating better than the rest of the national average. Yet a holistic approach to blue economy requires in addition to economic evaluation, also a societal and environmental evaluation of the main indicators uh, related to the region. We mainly uh, focused on uh, official reports and academic literature while we didn't uh, pursue any qualitative uh, uh, assessment. So we basically saw what was there and we did a descriptive um, ana synthesis and then analysis of the most important findings already recorded in uh, literature. Uh, we had the opportunity to consult some experts and research authorities um, in both states. And uh, one of uh, which experts uh, is Ian uh, Line, who's going to talk with, uh, uh, following uh, me while our main evaluation is referring to data collected before the pandemic and of course before uh, the war in uh, uh, Ukraine that may further impact uh, markets. So let's start with uh, the first slide of exchanging practice. So what we both saw is that being two Arctic nations, they are overall interested in similar living resources, which is ground fish. Alaska is the, the world's biggest producer in uh, Pollock and other white fish, while North Norway, uh, as we all know, uh, is mainly focusing on Atlantic uh, uh, on cod, while uh, salmonids in both regions are the most profitable uh, fisheries uh, resource. Both of them are also focusing on uh, different species of crabs, shrimps, and other uh, crustaceans. So. <clears throat> What was interesting for interesting for us looking at how salmon production has been operating in both regions is that uh, while uh, in Alaska, by law, finfish farming is not allowed, Alaskans have developed a really uh, successful hatcheries, hatcheries production system from the 70s onwards. And for those that you are not familiar with the hatcheries, hatcheries are mainly focusing on uh, incubating the salmon eggs and releasing the juvenile uh, fries in uh, with in the fresh water and uh, that way they both uh, regulate the production and uh, and the <clears throat> and, and and the market and uh, yeah the amount of salmon that they want to, to really release and uh, and use for commercial utilization on the other hand uh, norway has developed a unique uh, aquaculture program rapidly expanding uh, around the world and it's 
the most uh, profitable aquaculture uh, industry all over the world with 40% of total aquaculture, sal salmon aquaculture production originating from Norway and half of that coming from, uh, from Northern Norway. So we, we've been discussed that Alaska could look at such uh, successful uh, marketing strategies that Norway has been employing when it comes to salmon uh, uh, production, while they're rather now developing mariculture production in Alaska. And when we talk about mariculture in Alaska, we talk about uh, gel duck, uh, clam, uh, seaweed farming, which is a rather new and developing industry, could also draw insights from successful aquaculture stories in, uh, in Norway. On the other hand, the outstanding uh, performance of hatcheries in, uh, in Alaska could show um, to Norway how really a com local community can get engaged and how uh, salmon development can be fruitful for the benefit of, uh, of the local community. Uh, could you please proceed? So when it comes to the societal engagement, and this is something that we didn't really focus on on the report per se, but in some following uh, discussions and literature is that both states are uh, confronted with the issue of a lack of a systematized inclusion of uh, local and indigenous stakeholder in uh, fisheries and aquaculture production. As uh, the same implies for women that are now discovering about 5% of uh, the industry in both regions, yet human inclusion in uh, Alaska and North Norway is still higher and almost double than the national average. Uh, we also looked at some successful uh, local regionalized stories from both regions, such as the Alaska community-based uh, family and family-based uh, fisheries, and such as the Tamgas Creek hatchery, which is exclusively uh, led and organized by indigenous uh, local uh, communities and the Red King Crab uh, regime in uh, Finnmark, the governance of which, uh, according to which quotas are only granted to best cells registered in a uh, uh, Nurkap and Porsiger commune. And uh, although red crab has uh, appeared uh, as an invasive uh, alien species in uh, Nor Norway, this uh, regime shows that a local community can really get the most out of it for the benefit of the local population, job inclusion, and uh, and uh, avoidance also of out, out migration. This is a quite profitable industry, as we all know. Um, when it comes to Alaska, the community development quota, uh, according to which uh, 65 communities, 80% native are now uh, involved, can really help uh, keep Local, commun local communities uh, join this uh, quota system and then generate some sort of income that comes to help developing uh, the local community needs. Uh, when it comes to the Sami participation in fisheries, on the other hand, an institutionalized uh, inclusion of uh, Sami fisheries in, in the state's policy is, is yet minimal. Yet the Sami parliament at the moment provides some uh, business uh, schemes when it comes to Sami and, uh, and local uh, fishermen, some loans and other efforts uh, for support. But uh, when it comes to, to coastal uh, and indigenous fisheries, they are certainly much less uh, developed compared to indigenous uh, land rights on the land reindeer herding. Next slide, please. So we try to take the discussion a bit further and finally see whether such an exchange of uh, views could happen at the policy level. And uh, of course, both states are organized in a completely different system of uh, governance. Alaska is, uh, 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 the US is a federal state, while Norway is a unitary state. So in Norway, as many other issues are also related to much of decision making and governance is taking place in the south in oslo while in alaska um, the state of alaska has exclusive uh, established jurisdiction within uh, three uh, nautical miles and can enjoy within this zone the royalties of research development from there onwards responsible is the the federal state and <clears throat> This is provided already since uh, the 70s with the uh, Stephen Magnusson Act. So we saw that uh, in both official policies and 
and the two states are still not much, including uh, some other species that literature has been discussed as rather profitable and future uh, and uh, future exploitable resources such as uh, the low tropic species and algae that is something right now coming uh, becoming an important uh, issue for Norway and uh, the flounder and skates in Alaska. While uh, we also discussed that some uh, byproducts uh, from uh, fish waste, for example, uh, could also be further uh, utilized and contribute to both regions' uh, blue uh, future. And uh, finally, another finding in the, in the literature is that is much of this domestic uh, or uh, much of this uh, seafood production is happening outside the region. So if this is a general trend, both in North Norway and Alaska to deliver some products outside uh, the region for processing, while uh, in other third states, such as in Iceland, such efforts have been rather localized and really keep uh, communities involved and uh, processing is happening for the benefit of a uh, local community. And uh, could you please proceed? So, and uh, the last uh, slide, we came through, uh, a comprehensive um, addressing of uh, both re research institutions in both states. And we argue that uh, research frontiers could start to collaborate uh, further because although we are talking about two regions far from each other, there is a common research interest while some successful scientific practices such as the Alaska Citizen Science uh, Program that uh, comes to track uh, harmful toxins from uh, uh, algal, harmful algal uh, blooms uh, could uh, could uh, be inspiring for Norway. That is, for example, the Norwegian aquaculture has been nowadays also uh, be confronted with uh, some uh, uh, harmful algal uh, blooms. On uh, the other hand, Norway has other good scientific examples, such as the green light system established in uh, in uh, the aquaculture management. And uh, same examples could be drawn from uh, private uh, corporations and uh, entrepreneurs, such as the Westward Seafood in Alaska, that is utilizing uh, fish byproducts and oil uh, and fish oil to produce uh, fuels and uh, omega 3 uh, supplements. And uh, to conclude, such an interplay has come to do the Alaska program itself by bringing people involved in academic research in both regions uh, together. And uh, could you please follow the last slide? And uh, today we have uh, managed to deliver some uh, academic articles. Of course, our working uh, PAC3 report and a few contribution on, uh, on news in uh, both states. I would like to thank you very much and look forward to your comments and questions. I hope I cover it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, excellent starting point. Um, I want to give the floor directly to Ian and um, maybe Ian, you can say a bit more about what has happened maybe over the last two years, you know, uh, during the pandemic um, in Alaska when it comes to the development of mariculture, the challenges uh, the state uh, has been dealing with. Um, I, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, uh, that the current crisis in, in, in Europe has any impact on fisheries and aquaculture in Alaska, but maybe you also have some thoughts on that, but yeah, maybe you can enlighten us on, on the status quo uh, in Alaska. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Andreas. Yeah, I, I don't actually think I can give you a lot of insight on what's happened in the last uh, two years. I will say that the um, it, it remains to be seen how the war is really going to uh, affect salmon consumption, but Russia has been one of the larger uh, markets for pink salmon um, traditionally. So I, I assume that that will probably have an impact. Um, the, the report's a, a really interesting uh, study, and I, I think there are few more interesting areas to compare than Alaska and Norway when it comes to fisheries because they have such radically different approaches. Uh, we're very proud of our sustainable wild brand um, that has um, uh, worked out really well for us, although we've sort of reached a capacity and what that can um, produce. 
Uh, when you look at the low hanging fruit identified in the report, you know, if uh, Alaska is looking for new economic development opportunities, uh, looking at fin fish farming is um, sort of the obvious uh, place to go, but the politics around that are almost insurmountable, um, so much so that it's, <laughs> it's hardly a conversation uh, worth having up here because the, you know, the current industry would be very opposed to that. So uh, the other more interesting uh, aspect and what is happening in the most uh, recent time period is what's happening in the, the aquaculture, aquaculture industry. So with the oysters, uh, gooey duck, seaweed, um, that has seen a lot of growth, both in the numbers of farms and in the volume produced uh, recently, and we see a, a lot of growth potential for that moving forward. Uh, and a lot of that demand is uh, coming out of uh, Asia, perhaps uh, not uh, unexpectedly. Uh, if you look global, globally, um, you know, the, the population increase in the world is happening in Asia and Africa, and in particular, as those growing communities uh, mature economically, protein consumption rises uh, almost exponentially in there. So if you look, for example, at China between 2000 and 2010, population increased, uh, I think about 10%, while protein consumption increased almost 50%. And that can only come from a few areas, the you know, uh, ranching, uh, farming models that have worked in the US aren't tenable around other parts of the uh, world. And if we look to the sea where that's got to come from over the next uh, several years, um, we only have so many options. And so the, the mariculture really has a, a tremendous amount of promise for us moving forward. Um, I think the, the previous speaker really summed up uh, things pretty well. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else you want me to touch on, Andreas, but we're excited to look at this next chapter of the project um looking east to russia thank you very much ian uh, before um you know we go back over uh you know uh, back to norway and look eastward maybe i can ask our alaskan representatives here um it's maybe mr kevin meyer you know on on his two two cents you know on fisheries and agriculture development or mariculture development uh in 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 alaska you know and maybe from a policy perspective what has been the, the challenging um or the, the most difficult challenges over the past two years, you know, during the pandemic, and uh, what what do you think is the the future ahead? Also, with what Ian highlighted on on the on future markets, you know, on the other side of the Pacific. Uh, well, well, thank you. Uh, I think Ian did an excellent job of summarizing uh, Alaska and, and how how important our fishing industry is in Alaska. And Ian is right; we don't dare talk about farm fishing in in Alaska. We we pride ourselves in natural wild. Alaska salmon, and that, that's how we market it. Uh, you know, uh, we, we have different types of, of salmon. We have a red, pink, king, silver, um, white king. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what all species are here in Norway, but it's my understanding it's just Atlantic salmon. And so I don't know how, how those two compare. I'm not a, a fish expert by any means. But um, I think our biggest frustration we have as a policymaker in Alaska is that uh, we have a fair, pretty high unemployment rate with our Alaska Native folks, and we'd like to get them more in the industry. Whereas the industry them, themselves, uh, the majority of them are coming up from Seattle, and and then a lot of them that work on the uh, in the, in the processing plants are are folks that they bring over from the Philippines or, or Vietnam or, or somewhere. Uh, so that's that's something that we we need to work on more is is to uh, is to insist on hiring locally, and uh, and again that's 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 something we're working on as as a state. But the fishing industry is very uh, important to us. Uh, the state of Alaska itself does not get a whole lot of revenue from from the fish um, take, but but the, the local communities do, and and that's important to keep our local communities uh, healthy. So, uh, but yeah, uh, Ian is also correct. We are expanding in other areas of mariculture like kelp, seaweed, uh, gooey ducks is, is growing. Uh, a lot of oyster farms now uh, springing up. 
So we, uh, the blue economy, uh, as I know it and understand it, is is uh, important and expanding in Alaska, and and a lot of comparisons, as was mentioned, to to Norway. Uh, I've I've learned so much coming over here to Norway and just seeing how how much we are alike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe a quick follow up because Apostol has mentioned, you know, the not the lack, but the opportunity for both regions to increase, you know, processing facilities. You know, um, is there anything uh, similar or any policy uh, that is currently, you know, worked on that could increase process facilities also in in Alaska? You know, from I don't know a tax uh, perspective, or as I said, you know, bringing more local communities into the workforce. Um, yeah, you know, the, the processing side is, is a little tricky. Um, again, Ian may know this better than I, but I, I think some of the processing actually happens out in the ocean itself, not even not, not on, on shore. Uh, we do have some processing uh, facilities in various communities throughout, uh, throughout Alaska. Um, and again, we've, we've encouraged uh, and, and wanted these different processing plants to, to hire uh, locally. And I, you know, I actually I think they do. Uh, they do try. It's just that uh, uh, the pay isn't the best, <laughs> and, and so uh, a lot of the locals will not uh, or do not uh, want to work that type of work for uh, for the money that they're offering. So it's it's a challenge for us, and uh, uh, we we do offer some uh, incentives, tax incentives for the processing plants to uh, uh, build and. Uh, in, in, in state and like I said, we, we have several, maybe too many. Some of them are actually closing and consolidating. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we just need to do a, a better job of working with this industry as far as uh, hiring our uh, Alaskans. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Ian, anything to follow up from the Alaskan side? I think Lieutenant Governor is uh, correct. You know, when you look at the processing industry, it's a very challenging thing for us to compete on because uh, the labor that's brought in for uh, floating processors and, and some of that that's even shipped overseas, processed in China, and then brought back uh, is just not a place that we're going to be able to supply labor affordably. Where there is some potential is in the value add processing, and the previous speaker touched on this. Um, this is something that uh, if we ever have a chance to look at Iceland, for instance, they've been very successful in uh, finding additional products using uh, fish skin and uh, it's sort of building off of the, sort of the supplement processing and, and things like that. There's, um, they're using a much higher percentage of the total fish uh, body mass for value-add products. And that's something that we don't really do a very good job of in Alaska. All right, thank you very much. Um, maybe I can give the floor now to Gail and we are, you know, we're coming back from Alaska, you know, cross the ocean and go back to Norway. Um, Gail Hunderland, you see, you have been ex done extensive research over the past, correct me if I'm wrong, Gay, two decades on fisheries cooperation in in northern Norway, especially, you know, especially with the bilateral cooperation between Norway and, and Russia. And our initial idea, you know, as a next step of Alaska Nua was to, you know, to zoom in into the blue economy and look particularly at fisheries aquaculture co uh, cooperation potential between Alaska, North Norway, and Russia, uh, Northwest Russia. Um, it's gonna be a bit tricky, both from a research and a project management um, perspective at the moment, but, um, Maybe I can ask you, Gay, to give us, you know, a, a bit of a, especially to our American colleagues here, to give us a bit of an insight of what has happened over the past years and decades with regards to fisheries collaboration, uh, the management of fish stocks here in northern Norway together with uh, the Russian Federation, and what you think might be the way ahead, what's the challenge which we face, not only on the political level, but also on the, you know, management level with climate change, fish stocks moving north, but also with these more economic issues, you know, on uh, keeping the workforce here. I might just, before this um, event, there's an side event on the European Union's Arctic policy and how uh, the European Union might be able or not uh, to, you know, increase or uh, work against the demographic um, problems that North Norway is facing with more and more young people, you know, moving southward. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions to tackle. Gay, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us from Oslo. 
Thank you, Andreas. Um, let me first see if I manage to share my screen. Um, can you see my presentation now? And can you hear me? Yes, both. Both? Okay. No, thank you. Sorry, it takes a little while here. Yeah. Well, um, again, thank you, Andreas. And um, I must say, I'm very sorry I'm not with you in Buda. I was supposed to be there, but I have a COVID infection, which um, doesn't uh, go away as soon as I had hoped. And uh, yes, as Andreas said, I have been involved in uh, Russian-Norwegian fisheries management cooperation for I mean, uh, since I was uh, around 20 years old, actually, I started working in the Norwegian Coast Guard in the Barents Sea, uh, where I was a Russian interpreter and a fisheries inspector. Uh, then I worked for many years at the Fritjof Nansen Institute, conducting research, among other things, on Russian fisheries management and uh, Norwegian-Russian cooperation in the Barents Sea. And in recent years, I've uh, mostly been involved in um, assessments uh, according to private standards of Russian fisheries like the Marine Stewardship Council. So I'll give you a brief background and uh, perhaps I'll try to refer reflect a bit on the future at the end. I'll say a few words about the main management body of the Barents Sea Fisheries, the Joint Norwegian-Russian Fisheries Commission, and then a few words on uh, Northwest Russian fisheries management and the fishing industry on the Kola Peninsula or in Northwest Russia in general. Well, um, as we know, probably, um, the Barents Sea fisheries are uh, a very, um, I mean, uh, it's a very, a very rich uh, fishing ground with the cod stock there uh, being the world's largest um, cod stock. Um, right. <laughs> I think we lost Gade. I mean something that's not not my fault. <laughs> so I don't know. Should we? What do you think, Andres? Yeah. So do you lose everybody or just Ian? No, I just uh, I think Ian is still with us. I think yeah. it's just Gabe. So can you check if your Wi-Fi works? But it hasn't dropped. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> so we, he obviously lost connection because uh, yeah. everybody else is online, so, including us. All right. Um, are there any questions from the audience here on the I think it's. I think it's coming back. All right. Okay. okay. Very good. We we lost you, Gay. Are you yes, there? Yes, I lost you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see if I can get back to so you. Can still see my screen? Yes. No, yes. We can see you. We can see you. We can't see your screen. So you, you have to start sharing again. I think. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy sometimes that it happens to so many people. Okay, you start a presentation two weeks okay, ago. Okay, we see your PowerPoint sense. now. So <laughs> if you just start, if you just started the presentation mode, you will we'll be able to see. Yeah. Let's click on new speed letter amazing and start. I think will be yeah. Okay. And we're in business. Yeah, we're back. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So I'll try to move quickly ahead. Um, in 1975, Norway and Russia established a joint commission uh, for the management of the Barents Sea fish stocks. Um, most importantly, the commission sets total quotas for these stocks, TACs, total allowable catches, uh, based on scientific uh, recommendations from ISIS, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea. 
And also importantly, the most important stocks are shared 50-50 between Norway and Russia. That has been very important in um, avoiding conflict and also in um, uh, a sense of creating a sense of um, uh, this fish being our common fish. It would have been, I think, slightly different if uh, the stocks had been shared like 60, 40 or 70, 30. Um, I usually uh, use these two words in the heading here as central keywords for the Norwegian Russian management cooperation, pragmatism and compromise. The parties have always strived towards I think we lost him again. Would you like me to give the presentation? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it seems like Gay's connection is bad, so. Yeah. The question is really, I mean, uh, I can maybe quickly follow up with our idea was with the follow-up project on, on Alaska Moore was you know, move a, to move a bit away from the research angle and more into the people-to-people -people collaboration and you know, bringing stakeholders together angle. So the idea was, you know, and I was pretty successful in convincing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway to go that road uh, and, and really you know, involve experts and stakeholders from Northwest Russia and try to bring together stakeholders from Alaska, from North Norway and Northwest Russia in all three regions, you know, and really uh, bring those people together into one room, you know, and discuss, okay, that's only, that's our fishery status quo, that's what we're dealing with, agriculture-wise, fishery-wise, opportunity-wise, challenges, right? and what can we do together, you know, uh, from a, a very um, state-centered collaboration approach, you know, within that bigger uh, scheme and theme of Arctic cooperation, you know, and how can states actually work together here in the Arctic, and, and really, you know, zooming in into how regions can uh, can do that and how stakeholders can do that. Um, and, and again, uh, we hope to manage it somehow and to really, you know, uh, focus a bit more on the people to people collaboration. Um, we'll have to see if we can involve Russian, which is currently. I see Gate is back again. Gate is back, yeah, okay. So let's, let's try it again. Yeah. Um... Are, are you on a Wi Fi, Gate? Yes, I'm at home. Okay, but. You should not. You should. Uh, you should connect to a cable if you if you have the opportunity. No, I don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't think I've had a cable for a decade. <laughs> Let. Oh, it's out again. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. That's why I always write to the presenters, don't use a Wi-Fi. This is what happens. Uh, we have two questions in the chat. Yeah, all right. Yeah. So uh, the first one is, what do you see as the main challenges for Sami fishermen in Norway and fisherwomen, I guess? I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. You have to take <laughs> can you hear me? No. Uh, you can yeah. hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll move very quickly. Uh, yeah. The main thing with the Joint Norwegian Fisheries Commission is that it's a very tight cooperation. It's very extensive. It uh, involves all levels of fisheries management, from the scientific level to regulations to enforcement. Uh, there is also tight cooperation, close contact between the in enforcement authorities in uh, Norway and Northwest Russia. Uh, under the commission, there are a number of subcommittees and working groups working on a continuous basis. Over to uh, Northwest Russian fisheries or Russian fisheries management in general. Uh, it has to be noted that Russian fisheries management is highly centralized. Uh, authority rests solely uh, with the Federal Fisheries Agency, which is an ag agency under the purview of the Ministry of Agriculture. The um, Federal Fisheries Committee has an office in um, Murmansk or Severomorsk, outside Murmansk, uh, responsible for the Barents Sea, but it's not 
subject to regional authorities. It's not regional management. It's the, the, the office of the federal authority in the region. The Russian fishing um, fleet is also very different from the Norwegian fleet. The Norwegian fleet consists of several thousand small vessels, uh, while the Russians also taking the similar amount of uh, fish, 50%, of the total catches um, consists of a much smaller group of large modern trawlers and a few long liners. Uh, I'm not quite sure about the number right now. In Soviet times, it used to be two, three hundred trawlers. Uh, then I've seen in recent years uh, 150, 200, maybe between 100 and 150 now, as the vessels have become, become more. Um, uh, as the fleet has been um, okay, back to the so summary uh, question. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for this question. And uh, so when it comes to the Sami fishermen, someone can argue that they are by far the most discriminated uh, uh, percentage of the small scale of fisheries population, having experienced the large assimilation policy over the like many indigenous coastal people over the world during the first uh, half of the 20th uh, century and being largely also impacted by the introduction of the vessel quota, uh, this individual vessel quota system that is now in uh, Norwegian small scale fisheries with the quota being attached on the vessel and uh, this quota being extremely expensive and not many Sami fishermen being able to to, to buy that quota and uh, basically practice a traditional uh, way of life. On, uh, on the other hand, while Norway has been a global frontier when it comes to indigenous rights, um, there are no yet any legal developments when it comes to the rights of the Sami people in marine and coastal areas, as as traditional uh, marine hunting and, uh, and fishing, while uh, a, a, a litigation, Norwegian, uh, litigation which to a great extent uh, deciding on the basis of uh, the international covenant of civil and political rights article 2027 20, as the cultural practice of indigenous people has not yet come to acknowledge sami uh, practice in uh, in uh, in the sea so there's still a lot of uh, a lot of progress to be to be done and uh, yeah, to, to a great extent, uh, small scale Sami fishers can now be told this be only served through, through the main representative instrument, which is the Sami parliament, that uh, traditionally has also not focused predominantly on small scale fisheries rather than on land rights and, uh, and things going on on land. I hope that uh, covered your question. And, uh, we had another one as well. I, I had to go. So um, I'm Lisa, I'm the honorary person consul for Alaska. And um, those, both of those issues, and you're looking at similarities and what you can learn and that sort of thing. So Alaska just uh, appointed Mark Carlson Van Dort to the Alaska Fishing Commission. She's both indigenous and a woman. I believe she's a NANA regional corporation, indigenous person. And so that is something that Alaska is doing to address this issue, like you said, of the underrepresentation of indigenous people and women. I guess she's taking both those hats with one person. You could look at that as however you'd like, uh, but maybe that is a recommendation that can be made if um, indigenous Sami are not represented, but maybe they have a seat at this table to um, talk about policies and quotas. Yeah, indeed, and one of the main uh, focus of our societal evaluation was to try to list and enumerate such good ex examples and best practices. Also, the community development quota that comes to really help native and indigenous communities, and then try to extrapolate insights from both sides that would be really fruitful when it comes to a synergy. But indeed, there is there is a lot of dialogue to to be to be done, and uh, our work has been mainly focusing on putting things together and see what is there. But then it's the policy makers, politicians that need to sit on the table and really evaluate these uh, assessments and come with some uh, conclusions, some implementation of uh, yeah pragmatic approach. Maybe I can follow up on to all of you here, but uh, I, I guess some indigenous communities are well connected also across the Arctic Ocean, uh, you know, meeting in different fora, but is there also some kind of collaboration and competition issue, you know, or to, you know, at least some discussions to, uh, you know, to 
discuss problems on both sides of the ocean and we said okay we are facing this challenge are you, are you facing a similar one are you aware of such endeavors yeah i mean uh, the arctic uh with the permanent participation of the arctic council coastal and indigenous issues are quite often uh, being here and given that uh, the inuit circumpolar council which covers the inuit across across the arctic from uh, russia canada and uh, and the united uh, states and, and and greenland so a vast area that extends beyond territorial borders have been addressed to a great extent uh, their traditional way of life and how significant our coastal and uh, marine activities uh, for Arctic uh, indigenous peoples. But um, uh, from as far as uh, I know, uh, a systematized uh, effort at, uh, at uh, a binding level or at an interstate level has not yet uh, happened. And even though the Arctic Council is formed, such discussions to a great extent remain to be discussions. Thank you. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of progress to be done when it comes to that. Um, second question is, how do you see the Norwegian-Russian fisheries relationship in the Barents Sea in the aftermath of the war? <laughs> uh, we would need gate for that now, I guess. Uh, I could also reflect mm -hmm. uh, from a law of the sea perspective and uh, gate, if it, it comes back, she may, she may correct me, but uh, if uh, if someone thinks that uh, the um, the Joint Fisheries Commission was created in uh, in the as an RFMA was created in the 70s, and uh, so Norwegian and Russian collaboration has been happening there for so long, and uh, in an equal sharing of marine uh, marine resources, and to a great extent, it also prepared the path for the delineation of maritime zones among uh, Norway and Russia in the parties. It happened only about 25 years uh, later. So the both states are really in need of uh, collaboration when it comes to fisheries. And no matter what is going to happen in markets and uh, geo geopolitically, it's, it's highly possible that such instrument will continue to, to successfully function. And uh, wars have to do with states and borders, but the sea is one and the Arctic Ocean is interconnected. So fisheries will keep on uh, keep on traveling among among both regions. We had this summer this invasion of uh, Pukilax throughout uh, North Norway, the pink humpback uh, salmon. That uh, is quite catastrophic for uh, for local salmon populations and uh, states really need to collaborate and try to, to find uh, to find solutions, especially when it comes for invasive uh, invasive alien species that they are to a great extent highly unregulated so there's there is there is a need for russia and norway to no matter how the russia eu russia west relationship will develop in a post-ukraine uh, reality but there is a need for the two states to continue talk together and manage together fisheries at least from my personal point of view thank you but i mean i can only agree i think that all over europe uh, Huge discussions at the moment, you know, on, on, on the sanctions and how far the sanctions should go, you know. And of course, then you know you have maybe a state level, but then of course you have also regional and sub-regional levels, you know. And uh, the question is, of course, how much should they be affected from potential uh, sanctions, uh, and what's you know uh, how could they be uh, how could sanctions actually become the productive uh, for uh, neutral choice in those, for example. In fisheries and the Barents Sea. Um, okay, it seems Gay is not coming back. Maybe I'll have uh, if there are no questions here from the audience. Oh, they are. <laughs> All right, good. good. <laughs> Lisa, first again. Or? Oh, okay. Um, I, I guess my question is now with the pivot or the reevaluation of this part two of the Alaska North study, <clears throat> I'm not knowing what's happening with Russia. Hopefully, that can still continue with an analysis and that inclusion. It was mentioned by Ian and Lieutenant Governor Meyer about the fisheries and relationship between Alaska and Washington State and the blue economy that's between those two, for better and for worse. It might be an interesting expansion for this in the next phase to look at that, both from you know what does it mean and also from a policy and um, a suggestion for change. You know, so many things were established a long time ago, like you said, 1975 with Russia and 
Norway. Well, the same thing is true for Alaska and Washington State. And so maybe that analysis on that blue economy and how that affects the North for Alaska could be a really interesting um, analysis to say, okay, here's what's happening um, with that. And how could that be re-evaluated and looked at differently to uh, benefit the North? Ian, do you have something to, to add? No, that's a nice suggestion. Thank you. I appreciate that. So it, yeah, we, have it, a lot, we have a lot to talk about in this new environment, <laughs> this project. If I understand you correctly, it's really look into the relationship also between uh, Alaska and Washington. As it relates to the blue economy yeah. for Alaska, it's very much um, how there's a, a large powerhouse coming from Washington based on previous regulations. For example, you have the transportation of goods for Alaska that come through Washington state and the control that that means for the state of Alaska. Also fisheries, many of the fisher people come from Washington state and come up to Alaska and bring their processors on their ships and bring that back down to Washington state. But what does that mean mm -hmm. for this blue economy? And as you're reconsidering policies and practices, maybe that's something that can be discussed. That's a very good point because I think you can do a similar uh, analysis or start a similar discussion here in Norway, you know, in the relationship of, of North Norway or the two Nor North Norwegian regions and also. Uh, uh, thank you very much. We have another question, maybe you can briefly also introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm a master's student at the University of Alaska Anchorage, and I'm also a former commercial fisherman from Quebec Island. Um, and I was thinking, you know, when I think about the fisheries in Alaska, I think of some of the regional disparities. Um, especially this last year with the Yukon River um, failing and not even being able to provide subsistence to the people who live there um, compared to the Bristol Bay fishery, which is the world record to the you know, regional records, I guess. But I was wondering if you could speak to how there might be uh, regional disparities in, uh, in Norway and you know, I imagine that hydro has impacted the blue economy here and maybe how that kind of fits into how it works. Areas are able to, uh, to produce more more. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I think it's really diversified, and I think that its case study is really localized and may, may involve different actors and, and factors, but there are a few unsuccessful cases, such as the Yukon River, also in, uh, in, in Norway. For example, uh, when it comes to the management of the, of the Tana River in, uh, in, North, in North Finnmark and, uh, and Sami participation in, in traditional fisheries, there is a big, there has been historical at least, because I think now it's a big issue when it comes to, to local uh, participation and how state regulations and quotas have come really to put into the framework of traditional practices and subsistence activities and uh, regulating. Uh, in traditional uh, areas only for like uh, recreational fisheries and, and so on. So in inclusion and participatory rights, it's, it's it's something that is definitely happening here. But I think it's, it's individual case needs to be uh, unilaterally evaluated and, uh, and assessed. But I'm sure that like more, more someone is zooming in into a case study in, in, into geographical area, more case study can, can be drawn. And uh, the same implies like uh, throughout Norway and throughout Alaska and, and, and the US and throughout, throughout the Arctic. But- uh, so, I'm sorry, I have to carry up there. Andreas, you are now 30 seconds to wrap up before we- Okay, <laughs> then we're gonna talk about that. All right, uh, then there's nothing much to wrap up. I, thank you very much for everyone joining us here and Ian for staying up uh, and, you know, celebrating the 6th of April together with us. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Ian, um, really for, you know, your input. Uh, all the best to Anchorage. Uh, thank you very much to everyone thank joining you. online and here. Um, as we said, the next step would have been to look deeper and zooming into fisheries, agriculture, people-to-people -people collaboration between Alaska, North Norway and, and Russia, and of course Russia. Uh, let's see how we manage to you know, rephrase that now under current circumstances, but there are some ideas, uh, maybe bringing in other 
non per se our big stakeholders maybe from Scotland or somewhere else, but where we could really learn on how to, you know, take next steps into uh, potential collaboration beyond bilateral Arctic cooperation, but really, you know, uh, trans-regional or transnational Arctic cooperation, in, for example, in the sector of fisheries and agriculture. So thank you very much. Ian, again, thanks for, and Hong is kicking us out, so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>